Hello, welcome back. I'm Statman Dave, and today we take a look at Aston Villa, but mainly Unai Emery and the tactical tweaks that he made to beat Arteta's Arsenal and Guardiola's Man City. Aston Villa this season have been sublime. They're third in the Premier League, and they currently sit in the Champions League spots. They're great off the ball, they're fantastic in build-up, but also they're a big threat in transition. Emery's been setting Villa up in a bit of a 4-4-2 structure off the ball, but to really define Emery's Villa, we have to talk about the different phases of play. When Aston Villa squeeze high up the pitch, they press in a 4-4-2, 2 diamond with Douglas Louise as a number 10. Both wide players tuck inside and create a diamond pressing structure. As the play moves into the mid third of the pitch, Aston Villa do drop back into a 4 4 2 mid block, one of the best in the world of football right now. Aston Villa's 4 4 2 mid block is very difficult to play through. As they move to the final third, they drop their wingers at times and create sometimes what looks like a 6 2 2 structure. But there were some tactile tweaks that Emery used out of possession against Arsenal and Manchester City that were brilliant. On the ball, Emery's Villa have been an exciting team to watch. They build in a 4 triple 2 structure, but Emery also tweaked his structure in an attacking sense. He used Leon Bailey high up the pitch and actually used Yuri Tielemans off the line as one of his interiors. Interiors are wide midfielders that move inside and operate in the inside channels. Something that Emery Sevilla and Villarreal had in in abundance was these midfielders that would move wide. But the tactical tweak to start Yuri Tielemans as a striker in the defensive sense, who then drop off and become an interior, allowing Leon Bailey to have a 1v1 in the final third was a big reason why they beat not only Manchester City, but also Arsenal. So let's focus on that mid block, because Aston Villa was slightly changed in terms of their tactics. They pressed far less high against Manchester City and Arsenal, instead allowing Arsenal and City to have the ball in the defensive areas and dropping back into that 4-4-2 structure. Villa's 4-4-2 is very compact, it's also narrow, and it doesn't allow teams to play through. The key rules for Villa is to not allow midfielders to get turned to then play forward. They're always going to squeeze you super aggressively in that zone to not allow that. That's down to the nature of their high line. If midfielders get on the ball against Aston Villa with their high line, their ability to deal with the runners is going to be a lot harder. Instead, what Villa do is they allow the opposition's defenders to have the ball. It's almost counterintuitive when playing a high line, allowing time on the ball for the opposition's defenders. But because of the aggression in central midfield that we just highlighted there, as well as the mobility of the back line and the high position positioning of Emi Martinez, Villa looked very, very comfortable in both games. So just diving into the Arsenal game to show a few examples of this, uh, we pick up the play with uh, Ben White in possession at right centre-back. We can clearly see uh, Villa's back four, Luca Dean is just out of shot, the midfield four, um, you know, covering quite a narrow position on the pitch, and the two strikers. The idea for Villa is to not allow Martin Erdegaard to receive possession and to get turned, because again, as we mentioned, that puts threat on their high line. The other situation that we've got to look at out here is how they track midfield runners. In terms of their defence, they're quite mobile, they're quite quick. Ezri Concer, you know, Diego Carlos, Pau Torres and Luca Dean, who played against City and Arsenal, are reasonably mobile and are good at covering balls over the top. So what Emery basically wants you to do is play those low percentage passes. He wants to force you to play the perfect ball to get behind this mid block. And that really caused Arsenal and Man City a lot of problems. In this clip, we simply see Ben White play a ball over the top to Saka, uh, you know, and it breaks to Emi Martinez in goal. We've got another clip here, this time Zinchenko in possession of the football. But again, Zinchenko is not in between the lines. He's not breaking Aston Villa's shape. So they can allow him to get his head up. It's got to be a perfect pass. And once again, it breaks through to Emi Martinez. As the game kind of evolved, we saw another bit of a tactical tweak from Emery, and that was the use of Kamara as a third centre-back. So in terms of Arsenal and Manchester City, they both pose a real threat in the inside left channel. What I'm talking about there is the positioning of Kai Havertz for Arsenal and Julian Alvarez for Manchester City. Two players that arguably their best skill set is making those moves in behind the opponent's back line, and that can be a threat. If you're forcing your opponent to play the perfect ball to your central striker, versus two centre-backs, again, Villa should have a natural advantage. But also, if Ben White's playing the perfect pass to either Martinez from the outside or Saka on the outside, the wingers have really got to make something happen.
happen. So the danger for Aston Villa against City and against Arsenal with Julian Alvarez was the threat of that kind of left-sided central midfielder or left-side attacking midfielder or traditional inside left player. But what Emery had is tactical tweak. Not only did he not press as much in the opposition's uh, defensive third, but he had Kamara tracking Kai Havertz or tracking Julian Alvarez. On the other side, of course, Martin and Erdegaard um, was a little bit slower to advance, but Douglas Luiz would also follow him back. But more commonly, we saw kind of this kind of five at the back structure for Aston Villa to really track the, the forward runs. And that, again, nullifies a big, big threat. If we're not been able to play through the lines because Villa is so aggressive on our central midfield, we are looking to go, you know, beyond the opponent's defensive line. The combination of Jesus dropping off and Havertz moving the other way is a difficult th thing to deal with. But Emery using Kamara as a nominal centre-back in certain defensive situations was really, really good. Obviously, at times, if uh, Kai Havertz did drop into midfield or was a little deeper, Kamara once again would be on his back. But it was great tactics for Unai Emery. And we've got more examples of, uh, you know, forcing Arsenal into these really difficult passes. Uh, this time we can see the back five uh, made up with Kamara dropping, the midfield kind of three, uh, and the two players putting possession on the football that rotated between it being Bailey and Ollie Watkins against Arsenal, uh, and of course Yuri Tielemans and Ollie Watkins as well. But it forces you into a really difficult pass. Again, we see, um, you know, another situation this time time with Kamara dropping off. But another reason why Aston Villa are so good in this mid block, as we mentioned previously, is the mobility of the defenders. And I think that's a real big thing, is that when you find that perfect pass, as we see here with Gabriel over the top for Martinelli, when he's in behind the defence, Villa's ability to get back is absolutely fantastic. They're instantly dropping back into a good defensive structure. Goalkeeper's coming out in Amy Martinez, and of course Diego Carlos clears off the line. So when you actually penetrate them, and you get in behind the defence, the mobility of of their defenders and their you know real determination to get back is absolutely fantastic got another example this time with Zinchenko Gabriel Jesus making the run into the box but the way that Villa get back again you can see literally two Arsenal players uh, on screen five Aston Villa players another big big reason why Aston Villa got such a good result against Arsenal you know taking it a little bit further the things that we spoke about Villa stopping you playing through the heart of their midfield or stopping you in between the lines this was the single moment in in the two games, so in 180 minutes versus Arsenal and Man City, where Arsenal actually played through, or, or one of the opponents played through Aston Villa's press. Uh, you know, it's a little disorganised in terms of the pressure. Obviously, Diaby's come on as the number nine. This is the second half. Uh, Tielemans has been moved to the left-hand side because of the injury to Leon Bailey, which allows Zinchenko to get a little pocket of space, get his head up, play through. And this was the big chance for Arsenal with Martin Erdegaard at the edge of the box. But... That was one chance in 180 minutes. And I think you've got to give credit to Emery for his mid-block and how well and disciplined it is. You know, talking with that back five structure, which is highlighting it on screen once again. Uh, Kamara dropping to deal with Kai Havertz against Arsenal, but also Kamara um, dropping deep to deal with um, Julian Alvarez in that inside left position. The big things that what Arsenal want to do to you and Manchester City is they want to stretch you horizontally with the winger um, you know, receiving the ball, they want to draw your fullback out, and then they want to attack the channel. But you simply stop that if you trap the, that forward motion. And that was the first tactical tweet that Emery made from a defensive position, and it was arguably absolutely brilliant. You think over those those two games, you had, you know, one chance for Haaland, um, which was Phil Foden cutting inside from a wide area, using the, the movement of Haaland to kind of curve his run in behind the defence. Then you had that other chance for Martin Odegaard, Two chances that Villa conceded that were a big threat in 180 minutes against two of the best attacking teams in the league. Emery deserves a lot of credit for his defensive tactical tweaks. So spoken about the defensive tweaks, let's move on to the offensive changes that Emery made against Arsenal and Manchester City. And that was a slight change in personnel, which opened up a really big tactical advantage against Arsenal and City. So in terms of personnel, we saw Yuri Tielemann starting in a kind of centre-forward position. But what he did in the game was he dropped off and became came in interior. John McGinn inverted from the uh, left-hand side into the central area. Yuri Tillemans dropped off the line 
But Leon Bailey kept the width and the attacking depth of the team by playing super high. What this meant is that Villa created their box midfield with Yuri Tielemans, John McGinn, Kamara and Louise, but also had Leon Bailey on the opponent's back line, which created a number of different problems. The situations that you've got to deal with when facing Aston Villa, you've got to try and stop that, that central box being built and trying to press it and being aggressive out the back requires a man-to-man -man approach. For Aston Villa versus Arsenal, you can clearly see a 4v3 in terms central midfield, which means that either a centre-back needs to step up, which is what Manchester City did with a Kanji, or alternatively Zinchenko needs to narrow, which creates even more space for Leon Bailey when they can create those faux counter-attacking opportunities when playing through. But not only that, given the pressing structure that Arsenal used, Erdegaard high um, on Louise, Havertz high on Kamara, Jesus pressing the fullback, Saka committed, but also Ben White created further space for the play to be opened up. You're thinking that not only have you got problems with John McGinn now, who's picking up John McGinn, but similar to if Ollie Watkins was going to pull into the channel, you've got space to play there, but also, you know, either Tielemans or Leon Bailey will be free. And that provided so much issues for Arsenal. Aston Villa's build play was so good. And what really highlights it was that was the goal that they scored. They pulled Arsenal from one side to the other side, then utilised Tielemans' interior position off the line, created a 1v1 with Bailey, cut back for Watkins' goal time. So we picked the ball up with uh, Emi Martinez in possession. Um, what Arsenal uh, tried to do was squeeze in central midfield. You can see Kamara's straight away as soon as he's received has got pressure on his back. This is good from Arsenal. They're trying to force Villa to uh, you know play those long balls but Villa like doing that at times and we see that here. Kamara plays out to Paul Torres who chops back inside waiting for the right moment before clipping a little ball up to Ollie Watkins. As we mentioned previously Arsenal's pressing structure you've got Martin Erdegaard on Douglas Louise. Saka's providing pressure on the centre back which means that Ben White has got to press the full back which opens up that area behind for Ollie Watkins to receive to feet. This is causing Arsenal's defence a lot of problems. They're getting pulled one way, and then they're going to get hit on the other side. Ollie Watkins brings the ball down, plays back through central midfield to Douglas Luiz, who recycles through Kamara. We've now got a bit of a weird balance for Arsenal. The team's been dragged over, and we can see, you know, not only Gabriel, but also Saliba trying to get back over to a good defensive position. As uh, Kamara goes across his man again, plays out to... Diego Carlos, now we can see the problem. Yuri Tillemans has picked up a lovely little pocket of space and is going to be used as a ball option to play through, which we see in a minute. Ball's recycled out to Konza, then giving the attack width, uh, which triggers the pressing action for Zinchenko. Bailey cuts inside, then a little... Um, back up through methodology, through Kamara to Yuri Tielemans, who now is in space because the commitment of Zinchenko, the left fullback, has been on to jump on Bailey, which means that if, you know, Gabriel jumps on uh, Yuri Tielemans, he could easily get played past. So he's got to step off. Easy for Yuri Tielemans to turn in that interior position, slide the ball down the touchline for Leon Bailey, who now, instead of having a 1v1 with a fullback that's naturally going to be a little bit faster, 1v1 with Gabriel, carries him into the penalty area, checks on the outside, comes back on the inside, and John McGinn provides the finish. But this was very similar to how Aston Villa beat Manchester City. They drew the press on high, and then they used the interiors to bypass City's midfield, and then basically create a faux counter-attack for Leon Bailey. So pick the play up with uh, Esri Concert on the ball. You can see City's pressing structure is really aggressive. Julian Alvarez is on Kamara. Uh, we've got Kanji stepping into midfield on Yuri Tielemans, who's kind of dropped off the line. As the play gets recycled out to the kind of left-hand side of the pitch, City is squeezing in a super aggressive manner. But because they've gone man-to-man -man in midfield and John McGinn has tucked inside, he has got free space. And the use of the interiors by Unai Emery in both of these games is the reason why they could play through. Simply John McGinn receiving defeat and then turn past John Stone's pressure. It's really, really simple for Aston Villa. The switch of play now from interior to the right-hand side. Leon Bailey once again is on a, is in a 1v1 with a centre-back. This time, Josip Vardiol doesn't take his chance. But a similar thing happened for the goal where Aston Villa really utilised their ball retention. Then they broke the lines with a pass to the interior. Little flick from Yuri Tielemans to Leon Bailey. Leon Bailey 1v1 with a you know centre-back playing out of position. Driving inside, cutting across the team, little check inside and his deflective effort 
gives Aston Villa the win. But Emery's use of the interiors with Leon Bailey high was a big reason why not only Aston Villa beat Arsenal, but they also beat Manchester City. And I think you can see it from an average position perspective in both games. If we take a look at Villa's shape and structure, we can clearly see Leon Bailey there, number 31, the highest player on the pitch for Villa in terms of an average position perspective. We can also kind of see the box that's built uh, with John McGinn, with Yuri Tielemans, um, Douglas Louise, and of course Kamara. The interesting side here, obviously the substitutions meant that McGinn switched wings. But more importantly, the kind of average position against Manchester City for Aston Villa. Once again, we've got Leon Bailey, the highest player. We could clearly see the box of Kamara, Douglas Louise, John McGinn inverted, and Yuri Tielemans off the line. Tactically superb. Emery's basically creating a position either you deal with my interior or Leon Bailey's got a 1v1 out wide, or you deal with neither, as we saw with both of the goals against Man City and Arsenal. Villa, one of the best teams to watch in the Premier League right now, and the tactical tweaks that Emery made to beat two of the best teams in the league is very, very impressive. Aston Villa currently sit third in the league. They're on an unbeaten run at home of 15 games. They've won eight out of their eight games at Villa Park this season, scored 25 goals and conceded just five. Villa Park is an absolute fortress right now. But anyway guys, that's been my thoughts. Get into the comments below. How impressed have you been with Unai Emery's Aston Villa? And do you think the tactical tweaks won in the game? Or was it just individual brilliance? Get in the comments below. I've been Dave. Subscribe if you're new. We'll see you later. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, why not check out some more content on the Statman Dave YouTube channel?